Okay. Um, so, so you know, I, I'll I'll provide an introduction. I think most of you know um, Bob and the uh, people he's been working with. Um, this is a group effort. I'm sure Bob will acknowledge the other people working on this. But since he's the one standing up, he gets he gets the uh, embarrassing details about his life. Um, <laughs> so, so Bob, as you know, was a graduate student uh, with the group with Optimor and. Uh, and now is working as a postdoc um, on a variety of projects. Um, I, I think the most impressive thing about Bob is his perseverance. Um, uh, he, I, I often say he solved 11 of the four known problems on MSC. <laughs> um, it was, it's like he's like, was like one of the, he and Steve were like one of those early explorers who hacked their way into jungle pros and, and nobody really <laughs> expected them to come out the other end uh, alive but they did and, uh, and that, act, that actually diagnostic is actually working um, so so more recently Bob has been uh, uh, paying some attention to um, some more programmatic questions about where the fusion program is going and how it can make progress and and uh, this talk is going to be a result of some of that work so all right, well, thank you. Uh, let me also just mention we're recording this for everybody. Uh, so, you know, try to keep the stray noise down because that will get picked up by the. It's not a comment. Yeah, it's not a comment. Make them out. And there's pizza afterwards. So. Yes. Okay, so yes, uh, this is a talk um, that came out of a bunch of work that we've been doing with uh, me and Zach Hartwig and Brandon Storbaum and, and Dan Brunner. It's been a group effort over about the last uh, year, last six months, really in earnest. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with uh, an idea about how we can make fusion smaller. So this is a, a proposed reactor that MIT published um, two years ago. And it's quite a bit smaller than we had thought reactors could be, but it's still too big. So what can we do to get there faster? We need some small prototype. And the key ideas are a new technology, new traditional or non-traditional funding, modern innovation, to accelerate things. We call it Spark, soonest, smallest, we can't really decide. Um, private funded, <laughs> affordable, robust, compact. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start out with a non-working clicker. Okay. Um, so we're gonna start with a completely different area of, of science. We'll start with NASA prior to the 1990s. So here we have Carl Sagan, everyone's favorite astrophysicist, standing next to a model of Viking. Viking landed on Mars, um, two of them, uh, 1970, 75-ish, and it opened up an entirely new scientific endeavor. And the next steps were obvious, they were imminent. Everyone was excited about it. They made lists, and they, they agreed on these lists. Like, oh, we need to go and get a sample, and we need to return it back to Earth. And here's all the things you have to do to do that. And they put that list in front of NASA, they did it over and over again, and they said, okay, this is too, this is too much money, too much risk. They couldn't figure out how to, how to pare the list down. They'd always just end up with do it all or do <laughs> nothing, right? And so they got stuck. Meanwhile, other places at NASA are doing some interesting things. We send some big robotic space probes, and the first one goes pretty well, but then all of a sudden they get really expensive, and they start to go over budget, and way behind schedule, and Hubble six times over budget. They start to cannibalize a bunch of other parts of NASA that are so big and, and over budget. Um, and there was lots of consternation about this, and uh, this I think is the best summary of why those things were over budget and behind schedule. I'm gonna read it, it's, it's ready to read something like this, but he sums it up pretty well. This is a guy who built a bunch of spacecraft. The more money that's involved, the less risk people want to take. The less risk people want to take, the more they put into their designs to make sure their subsystem is super reliable. The more things they put in, the more expensive it gets. The more expensive it gets, the more instruments the scientists want to add, because the cost is getting so high that they know that it's the last opportunity. It's the last ship out of, last train out of the station. So little by little, the spacecraft becomes gilded. And you have these bad dreams about a spacecraft that's so bulky and so heavy, it won't get off the ground, never mind the overblown costs. It won't even work. And that boils down to the higher the cost, the more you want to protect your investment. So the more money you put into lowering your risk, and it becomes this vicious cycle. And it happens to <coughs> mega projects. We see this everywhere. But it was really happening at NASA. And then something really bad happened. These things started to fail, right? So this one couldn't send back the data. Just disappeared, right? This one? Oof, that was really ugly. Spent all that time and all that money, and now NASA's Mr. Magoo in the press. <laughs> this, this organization that's supposed to be technical prowess, technical spectacle, 
is suddenly, you know, a punchline. And so 1993, after all this, NASA, Congress, and the President, basically everybody agrees, we're done doing multi-billion dollar science missions. The budgets will be small, and if you go over budget, you will be canceled, and it's one failure, and we're done. Okay, so that's <clears throat> kind of sad. Where are we at in Fusion? So, um, we had a pretty good thing going with Tokamaks. In the 1980s, we built Jet and TFTR. They were the first Tokamaks that made significant fusion power. They used deuterium and tritium. And here is a control room. They turn on TFTR. Everyone's very excited, right? Um, 10 megawatts of fusion power. And the next steps were obvious. They were imminent. You know, here's, here's two days where the shots, the first DT shots on, on TFTR are making fusion powers. But we made lists, right? Oh, there's all these things we have to do. And we add up these lists, and it's a lot of money. It's a lot of risk. And the steps were widely agreed upon. These were endorsed, but there was no agreement on the order to do it. And it's always do it all or do nothing, right? And we get stuck. And then things really slowed down. So here's our progress. This is the, the central temperature of the plasma in millions of degrees. And this is the fusion triple product, basically the main figure of merit. And Tokamak screamed up here. In both axes, it was basically a decade per decade. And we got right up to where uh, uh, makes more power than it takes to run it, and we stalled out. And now we're waiting for the first power plant condition, which is ITER, and it's going to take 40 years to advance that. And this is ITER, it's 20 to 50 billion dollars. Right now, it's five to 10 times over cost. It's 20 years to build, 10 times behind, 10 years behind schedule, and it's under constant review about whether or even how, how or even whether to proceed. And it's up to the politicians to decide. This is now out of our court. Um, they'll either do it or they won't. Okay, that's all kind of sad, right? Um, and so that leads us to, to Spark. So the title is A Small Token Macro Changing Climates. And like any good talk title, it has multiple meanings, right? So here's the four changing climates that we think we see ourselves in. We see how innovation is done, that's changing. Private funding is changing, scientific R&D. There's climate, and its response is changing. And HTS, which I'm going to talk about later, changes the pathway you do to get to a token macro. A fusion reactor. And these set the stage for Spark, which is a token back with a targeted mission, the conservative plasma physics, with some challenges in the heat exhaust, but we, we think we've scoped some things, along with some, some magnets. <clears throat> okay, so let's start on the first one. So what did NASA do to get out of this? Right, obviously NASA still exists. In the 1995, they did something really crazy. There was a group that found $150 million within a different area of NASA. And what they did with that is they built this spacecraft, and they came in at Mach 25 on Mars. They didn't order anything. This came straight in. It bounced, boom, 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 across the surface. It opened up. A rover drove out. And they did three months of great science for $150 million on budget, on time, less than three years to do it. Right? And the world really took notice. Right? This was 1 20th the price, one third of the development time of Viking. Team of like 100 people. Right? This was supposed to be impossible. People were told this was career ending. You just simply couldn't do this. And here, cover of time. Every magazine or every newspaper had it on its cover. We had pictures from Mars, right? Live coverage on CNN. And it, it was a story this summer. It broke internet site visits for a long time. And it has a continuing legacy. You can go to the box office right now and see elements of this. Right? <laughs> and more importantly than just the public response, it changed how NASA did things. It really, it was a rising tide. It opened up a bunch of different ways. This became better, faster, cheaper, which grew the Mars budget from $50 million a year to over $800 million a year. And, and with this, they launched a series of rapid missions, each one bootstrapping on the success of the other ones. So here's that first little rover, the next set of rovers. One of these is still working 10 years later. Now we have a nuclear-powered SUV driving around on Mars. And we have two more that we're going to set, right? And it's a, it attacks, uh, attracts the best and the brightest, and we've got all this stuff, multi-billion dollars international effort mapping out Mars. And we look at our list, we've checked off a bunch of these different things. So although Pathfinder, it really only had three missions. It had to land, somehow, get down, right? Send out a rover to look at something and do some science. That was it. But it enabled this entire pathway, right? And they're almost there, because success breeds success. Now, let's just use our imagination, right? Like, what 20 years from now, what can fusion look like? Right now, if we don't do anything, it doesn't look terribly compelling. But 
you could picture if you were able to do something like a pathfinder, you know, increasing the fusion budget, retiring some of these things by building lots of devices, getting other people involved, right? Rising tide, and maybe even helping climate change. And so the question we were kind of faced with is some version of what is fusion energy's version of pathfinder? What's the minimally viable step that you can take to make progress? And in order to answer that, you're going to have to understand what Pathfinder was, what it was executing. So Pathfinder, without knowing at the time, was executing what we call a lean, start, a lean uh, innovation cycle. And the idea here is that you've got a big list of things you need to do. You need to find the most important thing in that list, right? And you need help to decide that because you have to iterate with your customer. You have to iterate with your sponsor. You have to figure out what's the important thing. You have to identify the assumptions. You have to... Find the, find the risks, build a plan, build something simple, and get around this thing fast. So like, why did Pathfinder not launch an orbiter, right? They could have $150 million, that's an easy orbiter. Because they knew, their hypothesis was, if we landed, it would open up things. That, that was what was keeping people from going to Mars. It's the fact that we couldn't land things there, or we didn't think we could. And the assumption was, for $150 million, that's enough money to do that small mission to land, as long as you put some innovation in. And if you can go around this cycle fast, you can really take on risk. Because if you fail, you can pivot, right? You don't spend 20 years doing something that then fails and you lose a career. And so this is now, um, there are some keys here, fast as possible. You know, always build the fastest, cheapest thing that everyone agrees is worth doing. That means you have to focus on the most valuable thing to do. And every time you go around here, you learn not just about your technology, you also learn about the world, the world around your technology. You learn what people value, you learn how that technology interacts with society, how it interacts with other technologies. Um, and you can cycle through this quickly. That means you can measure, return, and be rewarded. You can bootstrap. Success can be seen. And eventually, you get to a different market. You get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So this is the standard way to do technology now. The old way, you know, maybe in, in the, the Viking days, was you had some big plan and you executed a 10-year project you didn't know whether or not it was worth doing until the very end. Now, what you do is you go fast. So SpaceX, right, they had a problem. They wanted to go to Mars. They went around, they asked people. They said, why wouldn't you give us money to build a big rocket to go to Mars? And the answer they got was, because no private company has built a rocket. And so their hypothesis is, if we built a rocket, we would get more money. And because we flew it. Didn't, it wasn't if we built a big, big rocket, it was a rocket. And so they built a tiny rocket. It was $100 million. It was, it was almost laughable for, by most, most standards. Um, and they launched three times, and they blew it up three times. And then on the fourth time, it was successful, and they got half a billion dollar contract to build the next bigger rocket. And now, they're building really big rockets, and they're worth about $9 billion, and it's a successful technical endeavor. And every time they launch a rocket, they go through this cycle. They land it, they, they, they change a component, right? And it's not just you know the, the fancy ones. It's basically everybody. Intel, 14 weeks to make a chip um, five years ago. Now, 10 days to redo a, a chip line. So if they have a data center that's like, oh, we would like this feature, Intel can quickly go through this cycle and, and output a chip that can be tested, and the feature set can be verified, and then can go into production. GE, building water heaters, does this. Toyota, building cars. Your startup down the street does it. Right? Even the government now does this. this so some of the money that, that comes to support my work comes from NSF, who basically forces this cycle onto, lots of, onto certain aspects of grants. They had a meeting at the White House about science, and the topic was, how do we do this in science? Um, and it's been told, you know, it's coming down the pipeline that every other agency is going to do this. MIT, here's the 20 courses from last semester that taught this cycle. Right? It's, and, and really importantly for us, now there's private fusion companies now. That's a new thing. Um, and it's pretty easy to sit back and say, well, they're, they're silly, right? But the reality is they're attracting quite a bit of money. Um, and they have different concepts. We don't all agree on whether the physics works. But certainly, um, they're doing something OK. And what they're doing is they're executing this cycle. If we just pick one of them, general fusion, right? So what are they doing? Their hypothesis is if they were to show a break even in their little plasma by imploding it, they would have enough money to build out a bigger system. They could implode it a different way. And eventually, they would have a reactor. And so they go, they go out, and they, in the desert, use explosives and blow up plasmas. Right? That's what they do. And 
So they've gotten kind of around here. The first ones didn't really work. So they're cycling through this, and we'll see how fast they can bootstrap before they run out of money. Phi Alpha, it's all kind of the same story. So the question I'm stuck with is, why is no one doing this with a standard token map? These other concepts are orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude behind the standard token map. Um, but no one seems to be doing it. So maybe that's a good idea to do. Um, that's an element of Spark. All right, the next step is, where does money come from? So that, that Pathfinder example, they had to go out and find some, some money to do things. We need money to do things. So something interesting has happened in the last 10 years. Um, billionaires have started to privatize, privatize areas that used to be exclusively federally funded. Um, and there is a lot of these billionaires, a lot of them made their money by going through that cycle, that very fast innovation cycle. And there's much concern about this. I'm pretty concerned about this as well. But it is something that is happening. And they pick projects and they actually fund them. And there are certain types of projects. You know, here's astronomy. There's about $2 billion in giant telescopes right now that are under construction. Right? Here's this tiny guy down here, a static astronomer. This will be Hubble. Right? If you want to go out and do ocean research, your money, whether it comes from Woods Hole or Scripps, is going to come some, from some private entity now. In fact, this is an entire privately funded uh, institute with a ship. Right? Human Genome Project, nuclear power, brain science, astrophysics. Of course, here's space, which is the big poster child for all of this. Um, so private funding, this is, this is growing, but it's, it's not really a panacea. I'm not saying here that you know, there's an infinite amount of money. Um, you know, a million dollars, that might be OK to get. 10 million, eh, 100 million, pretty hard. Um, billions rare, 10 billion is impossible. And you've got to find a way to bootstrap. Every one of those projects I showed before right, had an initial minimally viable product. You showed, oh, if we could make one mirror segment and deform it the right way, we could get the optics to work. That means you just now have to make a bunch of mirror segments. That's a big telescope. And it has differences from the way that we're used to operating. So you know, how they pick the projects is different. So private funded, visibility, you know, those are all big cocktail party sort of things. Um, outsider approach, got to love the guys in a garage trying to beat IBM. Performance leads to money for the next cycle, and someday it has to have a payback. Either quant it has to be quantifiable; it can either be societal impact or some sort of product. Government-funded projects, well, you know, constituency um, is important. Consensus base; everyone's got to agree on the next step. Long term, you can make lots of progress on parallel paths for a long time, um, and you're supposed to show progress in understanding. This is more of a demonstration side, um, and these this side expects these projects to operate fast with the maximum learning per dollar breach step. They expect that fast cycle. And they have many great options, right? You saw all those cool things that they're doing. This is cutthroat. So we have to have a really good story. And it has to be doable. It can't be vaporware, right? So and it has to be impactful and demonstrable. So you got to go with what you have. OK. Now, the third climate, that's Earth's climate. Um, that's increasingly alarming to many people. Um, and it's driving industry and R&D, industry R&D funding back into clean energy, although that's going fairly slow. But it's really driving philanthropy and foundations into clean energy R&D, more than we saw before. Um, so here's just a Paris climate uh, talk, Bill Gates, he's there saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to take on climate change, and the only reason he's optimistic is because of innovation, right? And here's a Breakthrough Energy Coalition, that's $2 billion of a fund um, to fund early stage climate impact science. That's backed by $240 billion of net worth. And here's their statement. Um, Scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs can invent and scale the innovation, innovative technologies that will limit the impact of climate change. Like, what they're talking about in climate change is the story for fusion, right? It's, you know, we thought, okay, energy crisis in the 70s was a big deal. This is a really big deal for fusion. Fusion is, looks like it could be a solution for this. And when you go and you talk to people, they say, oh, climate change, you should do this for climate change. Yet fusion, as currently executed, is perceived to be too slow to impact climate change. OK, so that means we've got to go fast. Now, we're going to get to the next step. This is the, the first technical part. So you see you know, that these things you know, are kind of programmatic deals. And these things are technical deals. But we can't really separate the two, right? Because the programmatic deals, uh, these, this story sets what the rest of this is. So let's talk about the actual technology. OK, high temperature superconductors. These are really well suited for use in robust, compact, really high field magnets. So you know, the great thing about a superconductor 
is that you can put a lot of current through it, and it has no resistivity, so it doesn't dissipate any power. That's great. It's had superconductors for a long time. What it means when you look at it is, if you want to put current through copper, you need this much copper. If you want to put current through superconductor, you need this much superconductor. If you want to build a magnet where you really want a lot of current in a small space, you build it out of these. Right? That's how the LHC is built. That's how your MRI is built. However, there's limits to superconductors. So the amount of current that you can push through this depends on the, the temperature and the field that it finds itself in. So this is a surface, and you have to be below that surface for it to be a superconductor. If you're above that surface, it's a normal conductor, and it's not even a very good normal conductor. And notice, uh, this right here is what we call low temperature superconductor, Niobium 310. It's the, basically the, the cutting edge thing we had until 10 years ago. And it sits right down here. And if we were to slice through it um, at a constant temperature, we could see the current density versus field is falling off very quickly. So that means if you want to build a magnet, you want high field, you have to you have a limit. You can only build in this space, right? OK, so about 10 years, well, 20 years ago, they found a new, new um, superconductor. That's not very um, uncommon. It's about 100,000 superconductors. There's only six that have been commercially viable. And this one became commercially viable, and it's called high temperature superconductor. And this is what it does to that space. So it opens this space immensely. Look at these axes. Now you can have a superconductor that works at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And that's why they got their name, because that's really attractive for lots of things. But with that, it also works at really high fields. So now that cut has this line on it. There's now a superconductor that doesn't really care about what field you put it in, right? That means you can build high field compact devices. And furthermore, the way this is made is it's basically steel. It's really, really strong. So copper structurally is like goo, but this is really strong. So if you want to build a magnet, you care about what temperature you run it at, how, how much uh, current you can put in a small space, how high a field it works in, and how strong it is. This new technology changes all of those things. And the best part, it's commercially available. This is not fictitious. Here you go, Alibaba.com. You can buy this. Get it in a few weeks, right? Here is half a kilometer of it, delivered to the PSFC in September, three weeks notice. So this is stuff that exists, and people make magnets out of it. Right? We now have a qualitatively different tool to produce higher magnetic fields than we ever previously considered. And the first people that, that make magnets are, are MRI people. Man, magnets really enable their technology. Here's a 26 Tesla MRI magnet made out of that superconductor. That's a record. Right? And we that role of superconductor, now we've got a 10 Tesla intermediate bore coil sitting across the street. And this is a pretty exciting area for anyone that cares about magnets. Why do we care about magnets? Our, our Honorable Jeff Freiberg here. Magnetic fusion, as his name implies, requires high magnetic fields. So now we've got a tool to get high magnetic fields, a new tool that we didn't have before. OK, so that means we have to talk a little bit about a tokamak. I apologize for this. <laughs> All right, here's what a tokamak looks like. A tokamak uses high magnetic fields to confine the hot plasma long enough, well enough, so it can produce fusion power, so it can gain power. And it, we're only going to talk about four parts of the tokamak today. One, magnets. This is a magnet here. It looks like it's made out of copper in this case. You can see there's a, a ring of them. Um, this can find, actually provides the, the physics that can find the hot plasma. And if you want to make a reactor, you can't have dissipation in the magnet. You would use all your power to run the magnet um, if it was copper. So that means they have to be superconductors, which have to be cold. Okay. Then inside there, you have the actual plasma. It's confined by the magnetic field. It's hotter than the sun of the sun, right? Like five times hotter. And you'll go across the street today if you'd like and see a tokamak that can regularly make things hotter than the center of the sun. And inside there, you have the DT reaction, the fusion reaction. I'm hoping people made it to Earl and Anne's talk so they understand some of the nuclear physics of, of fusion. But suffice to say, you put in the right fuels of deuterium and tritium, you get it hot enough, and it reacts. And the helium exits the plasma, and high energy neutrons escape. And you, yeah, you really would like to make more fusion power than you put in, right? <laughs> this would be a reactor. If it doesn't make more fusion power than you put in, it's an experiment. If it makes more, a lot more, then it's a reactor, right? And in order to do that, you need to keep the heat in. Um, there's a, a one uh, caveat here. The plasma does touch the wall somewhere. That's kind of the exhaust port. We call that the diverter. But that exhaust port is, is being bombarded by plasma like a rocket engine. And then there's this piece, this blue here. That's the shield and blanket. And what it does 
is it absorbs the neutron that's, that's been created. That neutron's very high energy and converts it into heat. That's a good thing. Because now you can take that heat out and you make power with it. But it also shields the magnet from neutron damage. That neutron hits the magnet, it deposits its heat there, and it also damages it and limits the lifetime. And it breeds the fusion fuel because the, the tritium has to come from somewhere. And it comes from being bred in the blanket. Okay, so Q, this number, we've never got that higher than one in fusion. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. We like to have that number like 40. Okay, so that's a tokamak. One, uh, one more thing about tokamak. Two dimensions you have to remember. Um, basically, they all look the same. They're all like a donut. They might be a little bit taller or, or shorter, but um, all a donut, there's the major radius. It comes out this direction. And there's the magnetic field. Those are kind of the two characteristics that really define engineering a tokamak. And so you can make a plane out of this, right? B field down here, major radius here. And you can actually look at major radius. That goes a lot like, uh, like well, volume actually goes a lot like cost. So if you make something really big, it's really expensive. And you can break this roughly into three areas. You know, down below two meters of major radius, that's company university scale. So CMOD sits down there. This up here, the intermediate ones, national scale. So you have, you have a government. Right now, you have the governments involved. And this is so big that you need coalitions of governments to build. So here's the devices we built. So you'll go see our CMOD, the predecessor was here. Here's some other ones. There's, we built like 50 tokamaks, but here's just a selection. And these are the TFTR and JET. I talked about those earlier. And these are devices. This is under construction. These are, are proposed. And this has basically the entire development world eater behind it. And here's a, another part. OK. So if you need to make a reactor, and you need superconductors, and you're using Niagara 310, you can't operate in this space. You're, you have to operate in this space. Now, if we put Q, if we say, OK, run the plasma physics and see what Q is, it gives us lines like this. So Q equals 1. The fusion makes as much power as you put in is this line right here. And this is Q equals 0.2, so not very much power at all. Q5, and this is Q20, I think. So you get these lines. And this is just run-of-the-mill plasma physics. I'm not doing any things that have been demonstrated here. That means the reactor sits up in this corner. This is commonly known. A reactor is 5 meters and 5 to 6 tesla. And if you run the numbers and you look at the papers, there's maybe 30 papers that make reactor designs, they all kind of live up here. OK. So what should you do? Oh, well, the pathway is obvious. Scale up in field, and then go up in size the last min at the last minute as possible, because it's going to be really expensive. So this is Eater. Eater lives there. It's very big. Um, and here you go. From the Eater design of the magnet, the field is the highest that is practically achievable in large magnets with the available superconducting materials, 1997. So that's Eater. Now, what HDS does is it opens that space. OK, you're now faced with a bunch of questions about what you should do. One thing is, oh, this reactor line comes down, right? It means I can come down to a smaller size. But I can't go arbitrarily small. So I have to fit that shield in. There's nuclear physics that says you have to have that shield. So that cuts it off here. If you go smaller, you can't really shield it. That device I talked about, ARC, ARC lives right there. It's basically the smallest device that you could build and operate for 30 years. Um, and it's limited by its shielding, 9 Tesla. OK. Um, so the question is, if you have this device, what's the path to get there? Right? Um, it has a, a bunch of different things. You can go up, you can go down. Um, how do you get from where we are right now to this device? And that sets the stage for Spark. So a tokamak with a targeted mission. Um, we want to use this technique to figure out how to get to an arc, how to get to pilot plans. So we're going to hypothesize the problems that we should solve within the appetites, within the constraints that we have to get money, identify what sort of plasma physics and engineering works, find the risks, then go through and converge on what sort of thing is doable that is attractive to do, build as simple as it can do, as fast as it can go, run it, learn or don't learn, retire risks or engineering or don't, right? And learn about the attractiveness of fusion, and then repeat until fusion is either a reality or is disproven. So that's this cycle. Right now, this talk is only going to be these three things. This is a lot of work to do. But in six months, we've, we've done, an, I think, an OK job of these first three.
So let's start with our list. Same list from the beginning. So here's all the things we have to do in order to get a fusion pilot plant, a fusion reactor to work. There's a lot of things, a lot of people here that are really, really good at these different things. Um, each one is a, a big scientific endeavor in its own. And ARC was a really good start, but it was too expensive and too integrated. Right? It, it, we would need billions of dollars to go out and do it right now. And it was targeted at generating electricity for an industry that needed electricity reliably for a long period of time, like 60 years, cared about payback. And we know we can't just scale it down because it involves some nuclear physics. That means we have to de-scope it. So how do we factor all this? What set of these? What's the Pathfinder set of these that we do? So we can go through them. The ones down here, these are all things we have to have a good plan for, right? You set whether or not it's going to work economically and be attractive. Some of these you can do offline in parallel. Others, um, other people can do some of them. Some we have to do here, um, or whoever wants, you know, some of them are specific to certain technologies. And some of them actually just require a pilot plant. I mean, if you want to do long lifetime components and high availability, you have to do that in a pilot plant. That's the purpose of a pilot plant. This next step of things, long pulse plasma physics, steady state current drive, these require a long pulse integrated system. Those are kind of expensive systems. Um, and they're done in other existing or planned machines. We've got a lot of good ideas on how to do these. And if we want to do them at high Q, high gain, it requires a large device. Basically, it looks like a pilot plant. So that means that could be expensive. But these up here, these three, these are very high visibility. They can be done in a small device, a short pulse, and others are not going to do them anytime soon. Um, so we have a hypothesis. Demonstrating high gain plasmas and the key HTS technology could change the outlook. And it could be attractive to private funders at a couple hundred million dollars. That's sort of a level. The technology hypothesis is that we could actually get that using HTS magnets in a single machine um, at fairly small size. <laughs> and the next step is to do technical scoping and, and firm up the feasibility, identify the risk. And then once we have a menu item, once we have something that we can take out that's an actual you know, fully fledged idea, we can take it out in the real world and we can talk to people and see, oh, is this compelling enough? Is, did we pick the right set of problems? Maybe we didn't pick the right set of problems and we have to refactor it. But we can't, we can't make that decision until we have a menu item and we have someone to talk to. Right? So we'll test these two hypotheses. All right, that first, why did we pick the top three? Um, power gain appears to be a good metric on whether fusion works or not. If you go outside of the fusion community, that seems to be a pretty powerful idea, right? Um, here we go. Cover of time recently. The goal of all these machines is to pass break even, where it puts more energy out than it takes to run it. Forbes, the only problem we haven't figured out yet is how to reach break even. CNN, the important thing, viable, you have to create more energy than the energy you put in. New York Times, got to sustain a controlled fusion reaction. Hey, BBC, this could bring jet up to the coveted goal of breaking it. And this isn't a new thing. Here we go, all the way back to TFTR days. New York Times, goal of TFTR, break even. Okay, so it has some literature search in at least the public literature of what people talk about when they talk about fusion. It's also a long-established goal of the community, right? We've got reports upon reports that say, we should make a device that does break even. That's a pretty high priority. And it's a central goal of Eater. Eater does a lot of other things, but that's really one of the main selling points. If someone asks what Eater does, it's, oh, it makes more power out than they put in. And it's the goal of Fire, BTX, and a bunch of other designs that were really well flushed out. Flushed out. They, were, they were worked on with a lot of resources. And for me, it passes the gut check. Right? Like, the, the worst part about giving a tour is when someone asks if we've ever made power, uh, more power than we put in. And I, I just sink when I have to say, no, we have plans to do it, but they're going to take 30 years. Um, and, you know, here's, if you pick up an introductory textbook on fusion or physics, or plasma physics, there's a chapter on this, and it's usually the first one, because that's what, you know, helps sell the book. And this is a major milestone. Identified by <laughs> there you go, <yeah. laughs> major milestone identified by all these other startups that have attracted this money. You go and you talk to business people in, in those places. Their hypothesis is if they were to able to show break even neutron production, that'd be worth somewhere on the order of a billion dollars in, in additional money. Um, okay, so let's let's take this hypothesis and run with it and see if a high gain compact experiment using HDS would be attractive. Um, what's the technical challenges? Because it's one thing to be attractive, but it's another thing to actually be able to build it. So here's our device again. We're going to kind of work from the outside or inside out um, under the goal of Q equals one to five. Um, 
which we just picked, right? That's high enough gain, it seems like doable um, and would make a difference. All right, so we'll use a plasma physics model to do some plasma physics basis. Um, and really, the plasma physics, that defines our operating space. We're not gonna invent new plasma physics. We're not gonna rely on some entirely new regime of operation or some different confinement or, or some, some novel idea on the plasma physics. Vanilla plasma physics, we've been running tokamaks for, for 40 years, uh, 30 years, and we run a lot of them, we have a lot of experience. So just use a simple zero-D physics model based on empirical scaling relations. This is the standard approach. We're gonna use conservative plasma physics. If you don't understand what these are, that's okay, because this is for the plasma physicists. Um, so a spark, beta, beta normal of two, which is well below the limit, Greenwald fraction less than 0.75, well below the limit, Q95, three, lots of experience there, H98 of one. So there's no crazy scaling factors in here. This is similar to the eater, which most people consider to be conservative on plasma physics. Um, it's actually less than arc on plasma physics. And we're gonna self, the, the model just self-consistently solves the different, um, the, the set of, of coupled uh, performance as a function of input engineering parameters, and we just output Q, P fusion, the external heating power, the things we care about for actually running a token. And we can check that against existing designs if this sort of approach works pretty well. The bottom line, demonstrate applied the physics, determine what's physically feasible. That's where these plots came from, right? And they kind of have this, this strong structure. It's exactly what you would predict from just simple, like, scaling arguments. Now, we throw out arguments here about R to the 1.3 V cubed at constant power, uh, constant surface power. Um, that's where this scaling comes from. Okay, so if we, if we have to live here, one to five is between these two lines. Where do we go? Okay, let's just say, you know, this is the returns are getting less as you go down. Well, for the first cut, pick this space, right? So this space kind of looks like half the size of arc in a major radius. It's bigger than CMOS, which is a device C. And these are to scale. And by living down here, we have to live with some problems that we have to figure out. Um, in volume, that space is factor of 10 bigger than C mod, factor of 10 smaller than R, um, which is actually kind of the same factors that were done previously. So, um, and it's a similar size as is upgraded. These would be East, K star, Tor Super. Tokamaks we built a lot of. So, um, they can be built by a single sort of institution. Um, and this would actually make quite a bit of fusion power um, at these parameters. So this would make 50 to 200 megawatts of fusion power. So that's like 10 times the current record of fusion power. So it would be a big increment both in the gain and in the fusion power. And there's some also advantages to operating in that lower right corner. This is the current relaxation time. That's the longest time scale the plasma really cares about. Um, so that means you have to wait that long for your plasma to be in equilibrium. In a reactor, the plasma is always in equilibrium. So you definitely want to have a pulse length that's longer than the current relaxation time. You want to be a several times longer. And if you're up here, the current relaxation time is long. Some of these reactor designs have current relaxation times that are five hours. You've got to turn this thing on. You've got to wait five hours for it to, to be equilibrated before you can actually extract physics from it. Here, you have to wait seconds. There's a lot of problems. They're way easier at 10 seconds than 10 minutes. Right? Tritium issues, um, external power, nuclear issues, cooling. And the really, one of the other ones is diverter heating, right? There's a penalty to living down here, and that's diverters. Um, it's not really a penalty, it's kind of the same everywhere. Um, there's a figure of merit, P, B, or R. So P is the, the power that's being conducted out of the plasma. Um, B, the field, R, the size. Um, this is a figure of merit that says how challenging it is to exhaust the heat in a tokamak. Um, and it's, it's an empirically based figure of merit. And here's what those look like in our, our chart. So, uh, Sparks, it's here about 400 PB over R. That's really high. That, but it's actually kind of what you'd see in a reactor. Um, we have lots of experience lower. So we've got to talk about the heat exhaust challenge. So again, the diverter sits down here. We want to do three things. We don't want to melt it. Um, if you're doing a reactor, you don't want to erode it. You don't want to have thermal fatigue that makes it weak, right? But if you're doing short pulse, short life experiments, you don't really need to solve the erosion problem. And the fatigue, okay, you can probably handle that. You might not even need active cooling. Um, our experience base, um, this is Q parallel, which is uh, related to PV over R. Uh, it's the, the heat flux down the magnetic field line. The sun is this, C mod is 20 times higher. Then we gotta go up a lot for spark and reactors. 
And, and operating up in these ranges, that's unexplored. So physics models, we don't have them. They're not predicted. And we're not sure if we can project to the future. So this is a serious risk. Um, that means we have to use all the know, all known techniques. One of the key things is when we think about our mission, right? We have to, we don't have to have a, a, a part that scales to everything for this mission, right? When Pathfinder landed, it used airbags. The airbags bounced. And those only scale to a certain size of device you want to land on Mars. But in order to do anything, you have to land on Mars. And so they used airbags. And they used airbags for a couple more missions. And by the time they, they were done using airbags, they retired enough risk, the appetite was large to actually go out and develop precision landing, rocket assisted landing. So what's our airbag equivalent for the diverter is kind of what we're saying uh, for this particular mission, the subset we chose. So um, we're going to use all the techniques in the current set we have, put in two diverters, factor two, yes. Um, make the field line incident, that's factor 60, although we do that in most devices. Um, now we can sweep, aggressively sweep the strike point across a lot of material, basically put the heat into lots of material instead of really focused. Um, and here's a, a physics model that we, that Dan Brunner here has run, um, where we simulate the strike point going back and forth across a 25 centimeter long diverter. That's much longer than we typically think about running um, sweeps on diverters. Uh, and then we can see what sort of fraction of power needs to be radiated from the, the, the top of the plasma before it hits the diverter to get 10 seconds of full performance. So here's inertially cooled tungsten tiles. You have to radiate 75% of the power before it hit the diverter. Um, and at 10 seconds, you'd be up, but you'd be, low, be below the melting temperature. And this is, there's little um, 20 hertz signals here um, that are the sweeps across the surface. Right. Um, this is at, these are the parameters. So this is actually a really narrow heat flux width um, for those that are interested. Now, if we use the eater style actively, tungs, act, actively cooled tungsten monoblock, an existing technology that's been well qualified, then major production, um, it's going to be installed in several devices, or is installed in several devices. Now we, you know, cool it actively. We only have to, re we only require um, a half of our power to be radiated. And there's, there's devices that radiate way more than that, although not at these sort of heat fluxes. Um, and this actually, you could extend indefinitely. Um, so our mitigation strategies that we've identified. One, you could just run for shorter pulses, right? If you sacrificed um, some of the pulse length, you'd be okay. Um, two, draw from meter technology testing that increases the complexity, but we can. We can beat it up. We have fewer pulses than eater. Eater's 30,000 pulses. It has to last a really long time. Um, rely on strike point sweeping. I have to do that no matter what, uh, which is done on many devices, although ours is pretty aggressive. Um, rely on, on what we think are reasonable radiated fractions. They're not 99%. Um, however, these are untested, so we have to learn. And we would take it slow, of course. One of the great things about the diverter challenge is it's not like the magnets, where if you build them, they don't work, you're done. You know, if you build a diverter and it doesn't work at the operating point, you can descale the operating point. Yes, that's a big trade-off, it's a big hit, but it doesn't actually require changing how you build the device. Um, and then we can always change the diverter to carbon, which, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we anticipate future, reaction, uh, future research in this area to inform options, right? Like, this is also something that can be fairly late stage. All right, then we have this radiation problem. So remember, in, in Spark, what we did is we really you know, almost took out this shield. If we had to put the full shield in, it would be too big. And it serves the three purposes, protects the, the, the damage to the, the magnets, and that limits the lifetime of the machine. So if you need a machine that lasts 50 years at full power, you've got to have a big shield. But if you need a machine that only lasts a little while, you can make the shield way thinner. Um, it also absorbs the energy from fusion power. That has two purposes. One, peak power conversion. Two, this, this is a cryogenic system, the magnet. You don't want to put a lot of heat in that system. It breathes the tritium for the fuel cycle, which if you have a small device with a short lifetime, short pulse, you don't have to close the fuel cycle. Um, and to do these effectively in a reactor, all, all these at once, this shield has to be one to 1.5 meters thick. That's just straight from nuclear physics. It's just physics, you can't, you can't really beat it. You can, you can shave off 10%. But this makes the machine big, so the spark solution is run it thin and determine what the magnitude of the problem is. See if it's a problem that you can just handle. So to do that, we would do, we go to MCMP, which I'm told is the gold standard, certainly the standard we use at MIT. We have a lot of experience with this. It is, we have a nuclear department. Um, and we can build a parametric model. The model actually has to be 3D, because Spark is small enough that the neutron from one side can actually go all the way through it, the center. 
the center area, the center stack, that's the part that's going to get really bombarded the hardest, so we'll focus there. We can put in all of our geometry, and we can put our fusion from our plasma physics, our fusion power and neutron loadings. And we can even put in our geometry for our insulator and our high temperature superconductors. And these are the things that are going to end up burning up. And then we can study how, what's the neutron fluence, what's the insulator dose, and how much heat gets pumped into this magnet at various parameters of thickness and size and power. And we get plots like this. Um, so this is shield thickness on this axis. This is major radius, which, of course, power is screaming up here. And this is the number of 10-second shots to reach this number, which is a conservative estimate for how much neutron fluence the tapes and the magnet can take. So if you go above, so this says basically how many shots you can get before you burn up the magnet from hitting it with neutrons. This is 10 to the 3. So this plot, you know, the details here, okay, it's weakly dependent. The details are, it's thousands. Right? Here is the gamma dose. The insulator breaks down. This is a conservative estimate for existing insulators. Again, this plot goes up to the thousands. So that means if we just take a point out of here, you know, a 1.5 meter device with a 15 centimeter shield, that's you know, almost a factor of 10 smaller shield than what a reactor requires, we can get many thousands of shots. The total global experience of DT plasma is 875 shots. Um, that's 3,000 seconds. These are like 60,000 seconds. So now we've gone up an order of magnitude in shots and lifetime of running the device. And our current relaxation time, if you do this in terms of current relaxation times, the plasma is sitting there for millions. Not quite that. But it's, it's a lot. Um, so. But this looks pretty good. Okay, so that means the if you're okay with burning up the magnet just to get the experience, you could build it small. The next thing, cryogenic heating. So cryogenic magnets. This is the superstructure, uh, superconductor, and the structural case that holds the, 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 the forces. Those have to be put together because you can't transmit uh, force without really transmitting temperature. This are, these are sensitive to volumetric heating. Worst case, you put in too much heat, the superconductor gets too hot, and it becomes normal, the magnet quenches. A bad case, you have to actually derate the magnet, go to shorter pulse lengths, things like that. In all cases, the lower the operating temperature, the better off, or the worse off you are. And we'll show that next. All right. Again, here's our heating. It's it's in this is a pretty high scale, megawatts per meter cube. That's that's the figure we care about. And if we put our spot here for one to five megawatts per meter cube, that's pretty high. But remember, this is coming from fusion, right? This is a good problem to have. It means you're making many, many megawatts of fusion power, right? And yes, okay, now you have to deal with it in your magnet. Um, points of comparison. If you ask someone whether this is problematic, you get lots of answers. One, if, if you're only looking at low temperature 4 Kelvin magnets, like ITER, this is terrifying, right? ITER can take one hundredth of this. If you're doing a boiling LN2 system, liquid nitrogen system, uh, that's not so bad, actually. And if you're doing a car radiator, it's like, oh, that's easy, right? Single phase flow in a car radiator. But if you're doing a fission BWR, it's laughable. Like, oh, you guys are cute. Right? <laughs> so that means we have to actually look at this in detail because we've got lots of people's intuition because the temperature change and the coolant change are all different. Intuition is, is not necessarily a great guy. guy. Okay, first thing, um, remember those HTS magnets, they don't have to operate at 4 Kelvin. They have a, a range of places they can operate in temperature. And material properties are highly dependent on the temperature at low temperature. This is a log graph of specific heat, so the amount of joules to raise one kilogram by one Kelvin, right? Many orders of magnitude from four to 300 Kelvin, right? And, and if we aren't stuck at four Kelvin, we have access to other coolants, liquid hydrogen and liquid neon, our two liquids, the next two ones up. You would never even think about those for, an L for a low temperature superconductor magnet, because they're not superconductor at those temperatures. But ours are. Ours are all up to liquid nitrogen, which we don't think we could build a liquid nitrogen magnet. Um, so if you look at the boiling, the boiling temperatures here, 4, 20, 27, the Carnot efficiency is changing by a lot, which means you can, if you have to put power in at, at 4 Kelvin, you got to use a lot of power to extract it from the cryogenic system. The heat capacity is changing by an order of magnitude. The thermal conductivity is changing over an order of magnitude. So lots of things are changing. And what we see here, liquid helium, that's unattractive. We, we just can't do it with liquid helium. But these two coolants, okay, they look like they might pass the test. And if we allow the magnet to just adiabatically, uh, adiabatically heat up, so like start it at 4 Kelvin, dump in a bunch of heat, 
it ends up at 30 Kelvin um, before you're done. Well, we can only put in this, this sort of level of, of heating. This is not really effective enough. We need more. So adiabatic heating doesn't look too great. Um, for single flow phase flow, looks marginal if you use these. You have, to, you have to work pretty hard, pump on it pretty hard with a lot of cooling. But boiling, ah, if you can't take it out one way, take it out a different way. So boiling liquid hydrogen or liquid neon is very effective compared to liquid helium. Usually we don't like to boil liquid helium. Um, it's very expensive. It makes a lot of gas. You have to contain it all. So here's the numbers for helium. The liquid heat of vaporization, how many kilojoules it takes to boil a liter. We've gone up an order of magnitude. The gas volume from boiling it has gone down an order of magnitude. Right? And then if we take an, just an example of calculation, that means if we wanted to, to take out one megawatt, we'd be boiling 400 liters per second of liquid helium. Totally unfeasible. But these two, 10 liters per second to take out one megawatt, that's not a lot of boiling. Gas production of, of 1.2, this is at the temperature that it's in the magnet, 1.2 meters of cubic meters, that's not a lot. These are maybe reasonable. And if you run thermal hydraulic calculations with reasonable cooling channels geometries, um, you, you come up with, oh, you could put together a geometry that used two-phase flow, or at least looks promising, in these two coolants. And there's extensive test data. This is not made up stuff. Why, why would you ever use these? You use them for space reactors. You know, thank, thank you, the military. In the 60s to 80s, they made a whole series of liquid hydrogen-cooled space reactors. Um, and they got all the test data for cooling with two-phase flow in these coolants. Um, and also nuclear rocket engines, and rocket engines in general. And these, these cryogens, they behave classically, so you can go and you can calculate them with existing codes. And you have to get the right th physics properties in. Those are all known. We have an extensive user base for managing, managing them. <coughs> this liquid hydrogen is the second largest, maybe even the first largest cryogen used, because it's rocket fuel. Maybe a bad thing, but we at least have a lot of experience um, using it. But we never use it to super cool uh, superconducting magnets. That's because HTS is new. In the literature, it's like, oh, we can, we'll use this stuff for HTS. You can't do it with LTS. So our, our mitigation strategies, no, nope, no helium. But these two coolants are attractive. We could always increase the shielding or decrease the pulse length or lower the power and use adiabatic heating. We're within range on that. Um, force flow, high pressure may be possible, and two-phase boiling heat transfer looks pretty good. And note, this is only a problem in DD pulses. It's only when you have the fusion power actually on. You can turn the magnet on, it will sit there just fine. You can run DD, do a bunch of plasma physics. You don't have to worry about it. You can start up your pulse and then later put in your DT, and, you'll be, and then that's when this takes in. And we have experience by others in each of these areas, with expertise, and pulse operation at small size means that you don't have to have a huge cryo plant. You can sit there, you can fill a tank with cryogen, then push it through your magnet, boil it, then re-liquify re it over some period of time, and do that over and over again. It actually looks kind of like operating CMOD, which is a resistive magnet. If you're try, you know, resistive magnets, they're using, you know, order at least two orders of magnitude more heating per per meter cube than what we're talking about here. So we're still solving a big problem. And okay, so in summary, we've we looked at some technical investigations. I didn't talk about them all here. The magnets um, has some really useful properties for this mission. Plasma, we think we could do something like this away from limits and the small size only requires relatively short pulses, which is important for the diverter and the shield. The diverter, yes, we have to have mitigation strategies, um, but if we, if we focus on can we get something that just works, um, we might be able to get there. And the, the shield, a thin shield, that's what enables our small device. And if we did that, we would be able to make this device last a long time. Um, and we have to mitigate the heat, but that's actually, in my opinion, a sign you're doing something well. <laughs> if, you could, if you could run a supernatural magnet and make enough fusion power to quench it, um, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> so we've also looked at a bunch of other technical work, um, sensitivity to plasma physics assumptions, tritium requirements, land uh, licensing, handling it, uh, magnet density, magnet current densities, things like that. Um, so now, if we just look at where we're at now, we've, we have a hypothesis, high gain demonstration, be attractive. Um, we have to see. We'll have to cycle through and see that we could build this device. We know the risks. You know, risks are scope creep. That's always a risk. Next step is to converge on a, a problem device and funder. Um, do we have the right problem set? Do we have the right technology solutions? That's pretty cheap to do. And eventually, when you converge, 
you then execute the cycle, right? And C, get to here again, and then do it again. So let's just go back to our brainstorming idea, right? Like our imagination about fusion. Right now, we're stuck in neutral today. But we think maybe this sort of stuff could solve some problems here and prove some of the potential, at least the people that care about those sets of problems. And then that maybe turns other problems into opportunities. You have this thing that makes a bunch of power. How do you make it power longer? How do you make it last longer? Um, those sorts of questions. And there's a, you can't do it all alone. There's lots of infrastructure already existing to do this. And this stuff could all bootstrap. And eventually you get to a pilot plan and solve your problems. Maybe even do it in a timeline that impacts climate change. So um, this is the, the conclusion slide. Um, we think that a, a token map with a focused mission that uh, leverages some ideas on, on innovation, some ideas on, on funding and new technologies, and the, the need for carbon-free energy is attractive, and it, it's a natural thing for the PSFC to do. This is a place that does high fields. And the high field token map invented, perfected here. We just needed the high material science to catch up. We needed the HTS magnets. But we have people that have a lot of experience with those magnets, and we're an expert in this. And we, we have close integration with all the different uh, expertise that we would need. It's a right size lab to do things well, fast, uh, efficiently. And we, have, we don't have to worry about um, being perceived as outsiders as much anymore, because we're going to have some space open up. Um, and we're well equipped to secure this type of funding, because this is MIT. It's, it's an institution that can go out and actually do this. Um, and this approach, it fits well with where MIT's headed in general and with the climate thing. And more importantly, as a PSC, we've got the right set of people to do this. I think it's probably the only place in the world that can do it. Um, so that's Spark. Thanks.